Our next uh, one-person panel features another familiar face to many of us, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. If the last panel was Back to the Future, then I guess this second panel is Back to the Future, too. And uh, the Speaker is gracing us with his presence here today. Uh, he uh, served as Speaker from 1995 until 1999, uh, and uh, it is uh, an honor for us to have you uh, with us here today, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we welcome you, and I'll turn it to the gentleman from Michigan if he would like to extend. We're, we're grateful that he's here, and in the interest of time, I think we'll get started. Uh, I turn to the That's chairman fine. of the full committee. I turn to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Just well. simply say, since we're back to the future, too, where they went out to the Wild West, uh, your bill would give us a carbon footprint equivalent to 1875, which is about when the, that movie was. So we appreciate our speaker being here. That's your introduction, uh, Speaker uh, Gingrich. Uh, we uh, look for forward to hearing from uh, your testimony here today. Whenever you're comfortable, please begin. Well, let me thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I appreciate uh, uh, the sheer endurance that you and the members of this committee have shown so far. Make sure that microphone is on. I'm sorry, it, sh it should be on. Is it not on? Is the, is the light on? Yeah, my, the green light's on, so okay. this should be all right. Okay. Uh, I just want to thank you and, and commend you for the endurance that you all have shown so far. Can we say, Mr. Uh, Speaker, today. There, are, there are 21 witnesses after you, if, if you were to get a, <laughs> a sense of the place we are in the hearing today. Um, and I want to ask permission for my written testimony to be placed in the record. Without objection, in its entirety, it will be included in the record. I, I, to meet uh, Greg Walden's uh, per permanent question, I did begin reading the draft bill, but to be candid, uh, I stopped around page 236, uh, where it describes the Secretary of Energy as a, a jacuzzi czar uh, under the title Portable Electric Spa. Actually, it's page 233. And at that point, I decided I had the gist of the bill uh, and uh, decided I would develop my testimony. Let me just say, I, I want to begin with, uh, from a background, I, I uh, taught environmental studies at West Georgia College, was coordinator, I participated in the second Earth Day, I supported the clean air uh, system uh, that, that we developed uh, for sulfuric oxide, uh, which actually involved a very limited number of sites in the initial application. It was 263 units at 110 plants. Uh, later on, it was expanded to a total of 2,000 units, which the jacuzzi section alone would dwarf. Uh, and so I do think there's some substantial differences between what we did in 1990 in a bill that as a Republican whip I helped pass uh, and what you're looking at today. I want to start with two general observations, one from, uh, I guess, my namesake, King Canute, uh, and the other uh, from the Polish resistance to communism, which adopted the principle of 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, Canute was asked in the Middle Ages by his, his staff had been telling him how powerful he was. And so he went down to the ocean and told the waves to stop. And the waves did not stop. Uh, and he turned to his staff and said, this is a hint that I'm not as powerful as you've been saying. This bill strikes me as a remarkable inability to learn the lesson of King Canute. Um, if you look at the housing disaster where the Congress decided 15 years ago people who couldn't afford houses should buy houses and banks should loan money to people who couldn't afford to buy houses, and then you look at the Federal Reserve which decided that interest rates should be kept low enough to create a huge bubble on Wall Street, um, we don't seem to be able to learn from any of this. Uh, this bill massively expands the Department of Energy's power, gives all sorts of authority to the Secretary of Energy. Let, let, let me just quote two examples of why this is a huge mistake. The General Accounting Office said on the Future Gen project, which is very important to this country's future and very important to getting to green coal and carbon sequestration, quote, contrary to best practices, DOE did not base its decision to restructure Future Gen on a comprehensive analysis of factors such as the associated costs, benefits, and risk. DOE made its decision largely on the conclusion that costs for the original Future Gen had doubled and would escalate substantially. However, in its decision, DOE compared two cost estimates for the original Future Gen that were not comparable because DOE's $950 million estimate was in constant 2004 dollars and the $1.8 billion estimate of DOE's industry partners was inflated through 2017. So you end up in a situation where in the most important clean coal project of our time, 
the Department of Energy, which had promised in 2003 to deliver a working plan in 2008, announced in 2008 it might get to a working plan in 2016. On efficiency standards, the General Accounting Office said DOE has missed all 34 congressional deadlines, all 34 congressional deadlines, for setting energy efficiency standards for the 20 product categories with statutory deadlines that have passed. DOE's delays range from less than a year to 15 years. DOE has yet to finish 17 categories of such consumer products as kitchen ranges and ovens, dishwashers and water heaters, and such industrial equipment as distribution transformers. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory estimates that delays in setting standards for the four consumer product categories that consume the most energy, refrigerators and freezers, central air conditioners and heat pumps, water heaters and clothes washers, will cost $8 billion in foregone energy savings by 2030. DOE officials could not agree on the cause of delays. Now, I just want to suggest to you to take this department and give it 646 pages of additional power uh, is an astonishing avoidance of King Canute's record. The second is uh, that on page 362 in this bill, you in effect mandate an 83 percent reduction in carbon by 2050. Now, that's exactly like telling the ocean to quit moving. The idea that we are actually going to get an 83 percent reduction in carbon, in my judgment, is a fantasy barring a major scientific breakthrough which legislators have zero ability to legislate. You can invest in it, you can hope for it, but to legislate it strikes me as exactly King Canute's rule. On 2 plus 2 equals 4, I just want to I put in, my rec in the record a quote from George Weigel and a quote from Orwell's 1984, both of which point out that the state can tell you 2 plus 2 equals 5 but it isn't true. Uh, Congressman John Dingell captured the 2 plus 2 equals 4 exactly right when he said earlier today, this bill is a big tax increase. And I want to make this quite clear. This bill is an energy tax. President Obama's budget makes clear it's a $646 billion energy tax. That's what he has in the budget with an asterisk that says it will raise more than that. The press reports indicate the administration believes the, that that energy tax would actually raise around $1,900,000,000, which for a 648-page bill means it's between $1 and $3 billion a page. Now, energy tax kills jobs. And uh, the Vice President Gore was talking earlier about how China is improving. I just want to quote about India and China two things. Um, and this is from my, my written testimony. India is saying no to crippling its economy, no to stunning its growth, and no to punishing its citizens. A, a one particular member actually of, of the Indian delegation to the UN conference in Bonn said, quote, if the question is whether India will take on binding emission reduction commitments, the answer is no. He went on to say this sort of energy tax is morally wrong for India. China, too, believes emission caps are the wrong answer. The lead climate negotiator for China said the following regarding who should pay to cut emissions. Quote, as one of the developing countries, we are at the low end of the production line for the global economy. We produce products, and these products are consumed by other countries. This share of emissions should be taken by the consumers, not the producers. And in fact, what the Chinese are saying is they want us to pay for their, their emissions on the grounds that we buy their products, which I think is actually a, a pretty large amount of chutzpah. Um, the, um, as Energy Secretary Stephen Chu has said, quote, if other countries don't impose a cost on carbon, then we will be at a disadvantage. And I think in this economy at this time, that's the number one thing to look at. An energy tax punishes senior citizens. It punishes rural Americans. If you use electricity, it punishes you. If you use heating oil, it punishes you. If you use gasoline, it punishes you. This bill will increase your cost of living and may kill your job. Uh, the, one, the Tax Foundation estimates this bill uh, that an energy tax could kill 965,000 jobs and reduce the economy by $138 billion a year. What's even more troubling about this bill, though, is it continues a recent tradition uh, that Congress has adopted, and that is to move from Lincoln's government of the people, by the people, and for the people uh, towards a government which uh, punishes the people into behavior. I favor incentivizing the future. I am opposed to punishing the present. We did not create the transcontinental railroads by punishing stagecoaches. I could strongly support an incentivized bill to maximize new technologies and to maximize green technologies. I'd also point out that Vice President Gore's reference to 30 cents a day came from an intellectually dishonest EPA study, which included a 150 percent increase in the number of nuclear power plants. 
and the EPA study itself indicated that it had been instructed by the committee staff not to, in fact, base its study on the, on the bill. Uh, it's a footnote in the, in the EPA study. Now, prudence suggests that we do need to consider the facts and that there are reasonable, affordable steps that might work. This committee should look at where we Americans as a country can move forward. Vice President Gore cited three risks we face, economic concerns, national security concerns, and the environment. I would add a fourth risk, which is the threat of big government, big bureaucracy, big deficits, and political manipulation. And I'd be glad to engage in a dialogue on how we can meet these threats, because I think we do need a serious dialogue. You know, at Vice President Gore's request, I made a commercial with Speaker Pelosi. We said that we would address climate change, that we needed uh, cleaner energy sources, and that we needed a lot of innovation. I can accept all three of those. The, but a dialogue ought to be both ways. It ought to be not an automatic agreement or in a salute, but rather a genuine conversation. Uh, Vice President Gore made some startling and in some cases I think deeply misleading assertions. Um, he cited Bernie Madoff and described bad information and talked about massive fraud. But in fact, I think that um, it's very important to look in detail at his own testimony. Uh, he pointed, he said, for example, the rate, uh, this is a quote, the rate of new discoveries is falling for energy. That's factually not true. In the last three years, we have found 100 years of natural gas in the United States because we now have new technology drilling at 8,000 feet, and we have literally found 100 years of natural gas in the last three years. In Brazil, they found three fields, the, the 2P field alone in 2007, a second field recently, and just in January, an Exxon Hess consortium found a third field. Brazilian reserves have gone from 10 billion barrels to 100 billion. But of course, that's an offshore Atlantic Ocean field, which is which has up until last October illegal to look for in this country. The Bakken field in, New, in North Dakota and Montana has jumped from a 1995 U.S. Geological Survey estimate of 151 million barrels. In April of 2008, they raised it by 2,500 percent. They now believe there are between three and four billion barrels of oil in the Bakken field. What Vice President Gore does not tell you is that having supported the government stopping the exploration for oil, having supported the government stopping the development of shale oil in Colorado, having supported the reduction in the use of coal where we have 27 percent of the world reserves, we're then told that these government-imposed shortages prove we have no resources. That's fundamentally not true. And yet the Obama budget proposes to raise taxes on oil and, and uh, natural gas development at exactly the time this economy needs more development and more jobs. On the facts of climate change, we need a national inquiry. And, and let me be quite clear in the spirit of the commercial I did with Speaker Pelosi at Vice President Gore's request. I want to invite Vice President Gore to join in a nonpartisan inquiry. And I'd love to have this committee agree to help sponsor it so that every high school and college campus this coming October could have a discussion about the facts. For example, Vice President Gore in his testimony talked about the likelihood of a 20-foot rise in sea level. Let me say, if we had a catastrophic 20-foot rise in sea level, that would be bad. I'm happy to stipulate. That would be bad. However, even the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said the probable maximum is between 7 and 23 inches over the next 100 years. Now, 7 to 23 inches over 100 years is radically different than 20 feet. But let me go a couple stages further. A recent report on Greenland, this is uh, from the American Geophysical Union, a report uh, said the following, quote, so much for Greenland's, Greenland ice's Armageddon. And this is a quote within that. It has come to an end, glaciologist Tavi Murray of Swansea University in the United Kingdom said during a session at the meeting, quote, there seems to have been a synchronous switch off of the speed up, she said, nearly everywhere around southeast Greenland, outlet glacier flows have returned to the levels of 2000. That is from January of this year. Uh, on the question of uh, whether or not Antarctic ice is in fact shrinking, let me just quote from the Australians who said, slightly longer, Antarctica has 80 percent of the Earth's ice and, and uh, I mean 90 percent of the Earth's ice and 80 percent of its fresh water. Uh, according to the Australians, extensive melting of Antarctica ice sheets would be required to raise sea levels substantially. Ice is melting in parts of West Antarctica. Uh, the, the, the destabilization of the Wilkins Ice Shelf generated international headlines. However, the picture is very different in East Antarctica, which includes the territory claimed by Australia. 
East Antarctica is four times the size of West Antarctica, and parts of it are cooling. The Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research report prepared for last week's meeting of Antarctic Treaty Nations in Washington noted the South Pole had shown significant cooling in recent decades. Australia Antarctic Division Glaciology Program head Ian Allison said sea ice losses in West Antarctica over the past 30 years had been more than offset by increases in the Ross Sea region, just one sector of East Antarctica. Sea ice conditions have remained stable in Antarctica generally, Allison said. So ice core drilling and the uh, fast ice off Australia's Davis Station in East Antarctica by the Antarctic Climate and Ecosystems Cooperative Research Center shows that last year the ice had a maximum thickness of 1.89 meters, its densest in 10 years, close quote. Finally, on coral die-offs, it's hard to understand why carbon dioxide or current temperatures would lead to coral die-offs. Coral was very abundant in earlier eras when the Earth's temperature was as much as 10 to 15 degrees warmer and atmospheric uh, CO2 was two to seven times higher. I'm an amateur paleontologist. I would be glad to take the vice president to the Smithsonian or the American Museum of Natural History, where we can look at all sorts of uh, marine invertebrate life, uh, which is collected as, di as fossils because, in fact, they use carbon quite effectively. All I'm suggesting is that there is a sufficient debate over facts, not over theories, over facts, that would be very useful to have an inquiry on every co college and high school campus, allow everyone to present their evidence and discuss in a way a genuine dialogue about this. But while I think there is no evidence that we need to rush to a massive energy tax increase or a massive increase in government, there are many steps we could take that are reasonable and that are legitimate. I suggest 38 of them in my uh, testimony. I'm just going to mention a couple quickly here. First, I think we should rebuild the American economy with American energy, both for jobs and for national security. I think it is very important that we have a pro-American energy bias in our system. Second, I do think that green coal and carbon sequestration is the most important single breakthrough we can make because the objective fact is China is adding one coal-burning plant a week. There's no evidence they're going to slow down. And unless you get to an affordable green technology for coal, there is no possibility that American developments are going to affect the volume of, of carbon in the atmosphere because the Chinese will more than offset any savings we have. Third, I think that enhanced oil recovery as a component of carbon sequestration could lead to up to 100 billion barrels of additional oil coming out of existing fields, which is a key answer to the peak oil question, which creates jobs in the U.S., keeps money in the U.S., helps our foreign exchange rate, solves an environmental challenge while also solving an economic challenge. Fourth, the U.S. should expand the use of biofuels, including ethanol. And I, and I agree with two questions. One, on page eight, why would you exclude biomass from federal forest lands. I mean, I think that is, that is a, makes zero sense in terms of the sound management of, of federal forest and in terms of biomass. And second, on page 110, why would you exclude energy from municipal waste? If we can get methane production from municipal waste, why isn't that a totally legitimate by, uh, uh, use of biofuel on a renewable basis? Number five, you should add a section on nuclear energy. I thought the dialogue between the, the committee and Vice President Gore was fascinating. China has the, has the largest nuclear building program in the world. Now, if the Vice President wants to come here and tell this committee he's encouraged by China, then he has to confront nuclear energy. The French produce 80 percent of their electricity from nuclear energy. If we match that, we would, we would take 2 billion, 100 million tons of carbon dioxide a year out of the atmosphere. Uh, the fact is that Vice President Gore mentioned one-off reactors. That's entirely a function of government policy. If we wanted to, we could follow the Japanese and Canadians, develop a clear model of, of a, a routine, repetitive nuclear reactor, build a huge number of them. Uh, if you want to lower the cost of building nuclear power plants, streamline the permit system and streamline the litigation system, bring American production down to the rate of Japan or, or, or France. It takes five years to build a nuclear power plant in, in, in uh, Japan. It takes 15 to 20 if you can get past the litigation in the United States. And finally, any notion that civilian development of nuclear reactors by the United States has any impact on nuclear p weapons worldwide, I think requires you to ignore that North Korea and Iran are doing quite fine on their own, and they don't seem to have any need for an American nuclear program to develop their nuclear weapons. Sixth, I want to just close by recommending something that not just to this committee, but to the whole Congress. 
and this may be bolder than anything that's in the current bill. We are on the edge of a huge opportunity in science. There's going to be four to seven times as much new science in the next 25 years, 65 percent of it coming outside the United States. We have more scientists alive than all of previous human history. They are every year getting better computers and better instruments. They're connected by email and by zip code, I mean by email and by cell phone. Today, they are then connected there to, to licensing and venture capital and royalties so they can move from the laboratory to the market more rapidly than ever. We recently uh, had an Alzheimer's study group report that you know fully well about, uh, Chairman Markey, uh, where we, we proposed a very bold fundamental change in the Budget Act to go from an accountant-designed science budget to ask the scientific community the optimum they could invest. There is no zone other than, than health where it would be more appropriate than in the field of energy and the environment to fundamentally reshape how we invest in science and, and to set as a goal very radical, dramatic breakthroughs to get affordable, reproducible, and scalable breakthroughs in energy, uh, which I think are possible. I do think that part of this bill is moving in the right direction. I would love to find a way to design a very bold breakout, whether it's hydrogen, new materials technologies, or a variety of other things. I think they could be there, but I would just close by urging you, don't mandate beyond the technology. When we passed the act in 1990, we actually knew the technology existed. Uh, for sulfuric acid uh, to be to, to be dealt with, we didn't, and we did it for a very limited number of sites. This is a fundamentally different question, and it threatens the entire American economy. But I appreciate very much the chance to be here. We thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, very much. Um, we'll begin by recognizing the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me first, so I could attend to some other business, uh, Mr. Gingrich. Uh, as I hear what you're saying is it can't be done, it costs too much, there's really not that great a threat anyway, and we don't want to rush out and spend government money and have government programs in a large government. But it was interesting, your proposals were um, rebuild the American economy with greener energy. I assume that's going to cost somebody some money. Green coal and carbon sequestration. Of course we need it. It's going to cost some money enhanced oil recovery, expand biofuels, nuclear energy. Uh, we ought to ask the scientists how much money they want. I don't disagree with those, those ideas, but I don't know how you do it without spending some money. And uh, quite frankly, I'd rather give the marketplace some incentives to get some of these results than to have government funds uh, do it, uh, attempt to do it, because I think that free uh, economic system that we have is the best way to get results. But as I, um, as I look at your basic core argument, it's going to cost too much. And in fact, you said it's going to be a glorified $1 to $2 trillion new energy tax will cost households over $3,000 a year. Is, is that right? Is that your position? Um, well, the, the, those are the numbers I've seen. Okay. Well, those are numbers that have been cited. And the problem with these uh, numbers is they're simply not true. Uh, Republican members have cited this before in other, other uh, hearings, and they say that uh, this is supported by an MIT study. But the author of this study, Dr. John Riley, said the estimate is a gross exaggeration that his study is two years old, uses outdated data, examines a different piece of legislation. I I'd like to enter into the record, Mr. Chairman, Two letters that Dr. Riley sent to Minority Leader Boehner explaining that Republicans are mischaracterizing his work. Just yesterday, Dr. Riley confirmed that, quote, the Republican approach to estimating the cost of cap and trade is just wrong, end quote. EPA analyzed the uh, objection will be included in the record. Uh, the cost of the bill that Mr. Markey and I proposed, and this analysis says the bill will cost the average family less than 40 cents per day. When the American people hear statements that you have made, they get scared, which is exactly what I think is intended. Let's scare people. This is not a new tactic. I remember over the years we've heard it over and over again from industry. Twenty years ago, when we were doing the Clean Air Act, opponents of the acid rain provision said it would 
bankrupt the utility industry. In fact, we cut emissions in half at a fraction of the cost the naysayers predicted. They said it was certain that we lose the air conditioning in our office, build, uh, office buildings and that we simply couldn't make cleaner automobiles. All of these predictions turned out to be completely inaccurate. I believe that you are trying to give us a false choice. Our economic future and clean energy are inextricably intertwined. The economy that will grow the fastest in this century will, will be the one that makes the greatest investment in new energy technologies. Uh, nearly 40 years ago, this committee passed the original Clean Air Act. And since that time, in 40 years, we reduced dangerous air pollutants by 60 percent or more. You, you acted as if it would be incredible that we can reduce carbon emissions by huge numbers. Incredible. Yet we did that under the Clean Air Act. And during the same period, our population has grown by 50 percent and our economy by over 200 percent. There aren't that many of us in the room who were here when we did the Clean Air Act. I don't know if you, you certainly weren't here in 1970. You were here in 1990. We heard all of these scare tactics firsthand. And what the Congress did on a bipartisan basis is we let common sense prevail. We acted decisively to clean up air pollution. And our nation has benefited er ever since. And I would suggest that your ideas are not bold. They're a repeat of the old scare tactics. Let's get the American people really scared. The Democrats are going to charge you more money than it's impossible to achieve. Why, only the South Pole on one side is, is uh, sinking and the other side not. I, I just think that the American people ought to see through uh, what you have to say. And uh, I would hope you would not go to every campus to give your speeches but urge Republicans and Democrats to work together. Just don't attack Gore and attack the President and attack the Democrats. Work with us. And if you don't think it's a problem, then I don't know why you're even giving us those six or seven solutions, because I think there is a problem, and you want to face up to us and help us solve that problem. My time has expired, and yield back the time. Um, am I allowed to? Uh Respond? Yeah, the gentleman would be allowed to respond. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't ask yeah. a question, and, I, and I, 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 I don't mind if he responds, but the rules that I understand we have always had is members have five minutes to either ask a question, and I asked you one up front, and then to say whatever we want to say. Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I would uh, certainly uh, uh, think you ought to be able to respond if you want to, but that's going to be up to the committee. Uh, to, to violate the rules and give you an extra privilege that other Mr. Chairman, people have not had. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we have. The gentleman's time has expired, but I can well, recognize. Parliamentary uh, inquiry. Are, um, you know, asked to speak out of order. Either the one. The gentleman is recognized for that purpose. We, you, the chairman of the subcommittee, explicitly gave Vice President Gore earlier today the opportunity to respond to Congressman Radonovich's statement, which wasn't a question. And Mr. Markey. Well, that, that, in that, that case, if the gentleman would yield, I'll ask unanimous consent that the uh, uh, Mr. Gingrich be given three minutes to respond. Well, he should just be given a, we should, we should give the Speaker than, of the House the same much courtesy we gave the Vice President of the United States. I can do it much less than three minutes. Let me just say, first of all, that the $640 billion, $6 billion tax increase comes out of the Obama budget and has an asterisk indicating it will be more than that. Uh, that's not my number. That's the president's uh, director of the budget's number. Second, I'd no, ask. He said that's how much would come in the cap and trade program that would be then redistributed. Yes, that's, but it's in the budget, so so it could be redistributed. So you take money and you it redistribute. Could be redistributed. It. Okay, and you uh, propose some redistributing of dollars as well. On the MIT study, I'd where ask, does your money come from? I'd ask permission, if I might. Where does your money come from? For your well, ideas here, where is the money going to come from? that we're going to transform the American economy with American energy. Oh, look, I, I think when you pass where it's going to ha Where is it going to come from for green coal and carbon sequestration? That's an expensive proposition. We've got to do it. We've got to invest in it. Where is the money going to come from to transform the way scientists are able to do their First work? First of all, in a Congress which passed a $787 billion stimulus without reading the bill, I think we can find the money. 
Uh, I'm perfectly happy to work together to find the money. Second, I have never said I'm against the government incentivizing change. I'm against the government punishing change. Third, uh, I would last to put in the record a, a recent article in the Weekly Standard called Fuzzy Math, which is actually John McCormick's conversation with the MIT professor. And in terms of citations, I would cite uh, $10,800 cost per family of four by 2020, according to a Laffer study, $2,700 per family of four, according to Wharton Econometrics, uh, and $750 per year for the poorest quintile, according to the Center for Budget Policy Priorities, as some of my sources. Mr. Finally, Chairman, I don't object to any of those going in the record, but Mr. Gingrich, I'm sure glad you're not in charge of foreign policy. Do you think the only way to incentivize a country is by offering them more and more carrots? You know, you've got to have think some threat. And sometimes Chairman. you have to say, to incentivize you, we're going to give you some assistance, but there are going to be consequences. Mr. Chairman, I don't think of American citizens the way I think of foreign dictators, and I don't think this Congress should punish the American people. I think this Congress has every right to reward the American people, but I don't think Lincoln's government of the people, by the people, and for the people should be turned into a government punishing the people, and that's a major difference. Lastly, I'd point out that in the EPA analysis of your bill, your bill's not complete. And the EPA analysis included a 150 percent increase in nuclear power, and there's no nuclear power section of the bill. So I'd be perfectly happy to talk to you in more detail when the bill's complete. I'd be glad to come back and testify if the bill gets completed. But this is an incomplete bill, and the EPA analysis had certain assumptions that don't relate to the bill. But I'm always delighted uh, to be here with the chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, chairman. Just want to put in the record this famous MIT study um, is based between 2015 and 2050. There would be an annual, annual, which means every year, average of $366 billion in revenues. You take that number, you divide by the number of households in America, which MIT estimates to be 117 million, and lo and behold, that equals $3,128 per household. Now, you can redistribute it. You can play with the numbers. You can, you can go up on your allowances, down on your allowances. But the fact remains, if we put anything close to what we think Mr. Markey and Mr. Waxman are going to put on the table in terms of a cap and trade system, it's going to raise huge amounts of money, billions and billions of dollars every year and somebody's going to pay for it, and that somebody is the American taxpayer and the American consumer. That's number one. Number two, when Mr. Waxman asks about how you do the research and how you pay for carbon sequestration, he well knows that Mr. Boucher and myself and other members of the committee have a bill that assesses a very small fee, a per mill fee, uh, per megawatt or, or you know, megawatt of, of electricity produced where the industry itself pays for the fund that develops the sequestration um, technology for carbon capture or conversion and sequestration. That bill is part of the 648-page draft. The voucher proposal that I support and many Republicans support is in this draft bill. What is not in this draft bill is the actual allowance system scheme and who gets free allowances and who has to pay for allowances. That is not in this bill. And that's, there may be good reasons why it's not in the bill, but it's not in the bill. Now, my question to you, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the draft bill uh, has a renewable electricity portfolio standard called RES, but it does not include nuclear power, it does not include clean coal technology. The Republican alternative will have a clean energy standard which will include both nuclear and clean coal technology. Which of those two definitions, if any, do you support? Well, obviously I would support including clean coal technology and, and nuclear power, but let me point out uh, in terms of one of the things that the chairman asked me a minute ago. Uh, if you simply pass regulatory and litigation reform for nuclear power, I suspect you get a dramatic increase in nuclear power investment at no cost to the federal government. 
uh, it'd be very interesting for the committee to hold a hearing and invite in the nuclear power industry and say if we wanted to have a robust nuclear power industry with no federal investment, what changes would we need to get to a clean, simple, guaranteed approach that allowed companies to go out and actually build a nuclear power plant? And I think you'd be startled at how many nuclear power plants you could build if they didn't, weren't faced with massive litigation, continuous regulation, uh, and an increasingly difficult to deal with Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, which in effect has virtually guaranteed that it is too expensive to build the very plant here that is routinely built in either France or uh, Japan. Okay. My last question, Mr. Speaker. I think we have pointed out repeatedly the, uh, the problems with the cap and trade system. Um, the fact that it doesn't work, it hasn't worked in Europe, it's going to be hugely expensive, it's going to cost lots of money, and it's going to cost millions of American jobs. The Republican alternative does away with cap and trade and puts in its place an efficiency or performance standard uh, similar to what we put in the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990. We use the existing the best available technology as the standard and then give an incentive for uh, uh, plants, if they develop better technology, they then get a um, accelerated depreciation on their on their tax returns. Um, I know you haven't had a chance to look at the Republican alternative, but does that sound like something that would be better in your view than a cap and trade program that simply doesn't work? Look, I think the history of America is that when you reward people, when you have prizes, when you have incentives. You can get extraordinary levels of entrepreneurial energy and an amazing amount of inventiveness. And historically, whether it was prizes for airlines, uh, for aviation breakthroughs in the 20s and 30s, or it was the grants of land in order to build the railroads, the, trans the transcontinental railroad in the 19th century, we have been very successful as a country in incentivizing the future. We are not very effective when we either bureaucratize it or punish the present. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I must say this has been surprising testimony because uh, I think many people will ask what happened to the old Newt Gingrich. Uh, we expected an optimist, uh, someone who believes in the creative power of the American economy, but we've had a sudden attack of pessimism that we can't solve this problem. And, and I want to ask you some questions about that. Uh, perhaps we can put up a chart here on this on this uh, screen about some questions you were asked on February 15, 1970, if we can get the first slide up. Uh, you were basically asked, you're going to help us out there, I hope. Seven. You were basically asked if you supported a, a cap on carbon in 1970, which basically is what this bill is. This is the, uh, excuse me, 2007. And, um, you said, and I'm just going to read several of your quotes, you said, I think that if you have a mandatory, have mandatory caps combined with a trading system, much like we did with sulfur, and if you have a tax incentive program for investing in the solutions, that there's a package that's very, very good. And frankly, it's something I would strongly support. This bill is exactly that package. It is a mandatory cap. It protects Americans from unrestrained pollution. It is exactly what we did for sulfur dioxide. And we'll put up the next slide, please. We'll just take some, just so, you, just so you'll know I'm not just picking these at random. In the same interview, you said the caps with the trading system on sulfur has worked brilliantly. It has brought free market attitudes, entrepreneurship, and technology, and made it very profitable to have less sulfur. So people said, wow, it's worth my time and effort. Next slide, please. You went on to say, and I'll read this. Um, I think, I'll just read the last paragraph. I think that we're right at a tipping point where you could begin to imagine the development of an entirely new generation of systems where you had a combination of a carbon cap with a trading system. You had prizes for the invention of major breakthroughs, and you had incentives for investing in the new breakthroughs and accelerating their use and their development. And you could imagine a world 15 years from now that is dramatically green greener than the world we're currently in." Close quote. Now, the bill that we're working on does basically what you said you wanted to see happen in 2007. It is a mandatory cap. We are no longer allow polluting industries to put 
pollution in unlimited amounts into the atmosphere. And we are going to require polluting industries to pay some amount for the right to put pollution into this atmosphere. We will use a trading system to have the most efficient as the market will determine allocation of that scarce resource. We will have investment in these technologies of the ones that you alluded to. We have incentives in this bill, tax and otherwise, just as you alluded to in 2007. So I'm trying to figure out why this massive change in your position. And I ask myself, well, is it because we found out that this program would be more expensive than we thought? Well, I know that's not the situation. I'm holding a letter of April 14th from Mr. Dr. John Riley of MIT, who is the author of this report being quoted by Republicans trying to scare Americans thinking this is going to destroy the economy. And what he said is, quote, Dear Representative Boehner, I write to correct an estimate I sent on April 13th to counter what we feel is a misrepresentation of our work by the National Republican Congressional Committee. Continuing. A correct estimate of that cost, as opposed to auction revenue for the average household just in 2015, is about $80 per family, or $65 if more appropriately stated in present value terms, discounted at an annual 4 percent rate, close quote. That is 18 cents per day. The Republican Party, unfortunately, is trying to tell people that the continued climate that we have here is too expensive at 18 cents a day. I don't believe that's too expensive. I also believe it could end up being cheaper given the enormous technological creativity of our economy. So I'll just ask you this, uh, just a very, very simple question, Mr. Gingrich. Do you believe uh, a dramatic reduction by use of a cap and trade system that would cost Americans 18 cents a day is too much to pay to save the planet? Well, as I said earlier, I think 2 plus 2 equals 4. And if you think that the $646 billion Obama tax increase in his budget can be translated into 18 cents a day, I think you probably think 2 plus 2 equals 700. The fact is the cap and trade system I supported in 1970 affected 263 units and at its peak affected 2,000. Now, if you want to write a bill, that covers the 2,000 most polluting places and say, fine, those 2,000 are part of cap and trade, I'd be glad to look at it. Could I, if could you I would ask include, you? as I said in the, if you, I might, if you include, mm -hmm. as I said in that quote, very strong incentives, I'd be glad to look at it. If you include prizes, I'd be glad to look at it. If you would liberate the nuclear power industry from trial lawyers and regulatory controls, I'd be glad to look at it. This bill does none of those things. This bill actually has the Department of the Secretary of, Edu of Energy regulating jacuzzis. Now, the idea that we're going to have a cap and trade system that regulates jacuzzis strikes me as close to being nuts. Could I just, I, I just really would like you, I'd like to know what you think about this. By the way, the only jacuzzis this will regulate will have to produce 2,500 megawatts of energy, okay, to be covered. So you don't have to worry about jacuzzis. But just let me ask you this question. In your opinion, do you believe 18 cents a day for the American family is too much to save the planet? You can give us your thoughts about that. What do you think? I think if you could, if you could convince anybody that that's the real price, I'd well, have, I, I said a while ago, then explain the $646 billion that's in the Obama budget. I mean, well, if, if you and just, the president have an argument, you don't have an argument with me, I'm citing the president. Well, let me just, just ask you, let me ask comment. for a second, because maybe I misunderstood, so maybe you can help me, Congressman Inslee. On page 233, uh, line 5, portable electric spas. Now, I don't know what a portable electric spa is. I was told it was a jacuzzi. But that's in this bill, page 233. Now, that's why I said, when I got to that point, I quit reading the bill. We will give you a hot spa that is energy efficient. I hope that doesn't offend you. Uh, My point is, is that the economists who are testifying in this committee, including one called by the Republicans yesterday, said there would be a minimal cost of this. One yesterday, uh, Dr. Jay Apt, former uh, U.S. astronaut, told us that it won't cost us any more than, than compliance with the Clean Air Act. He said that was well worth the cost. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I just want to go back to John Dingell's statement earlier this morning when he said that cap and trade is a tax and it's a real big one. 
uh, and the EU screwed this thing up twice, uh, to put it in his words. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's, it is good to have you back, and I'm one that believes that we can, in fact, reduce emissions and deal uh, with, with the issue in, uh, in, a, in a major way. And you and I were both in the Congress with Mr. Barton, Mr. Markey, certainly Mr. Dingell. When we took this issue up back in the 90s called the BTU tax. A lot of us labeled it the big time unemployment. And we knew at the time that the Senate was never going to take that bill up. But somehow we had a march in the House. Uh, the Republicans were in the minority and that BTU tax uh, did pass uh, 219 to 213, and the Senate, to their word, never took the bill up. As we look at the landscape today, with the Senate failing to, to take up uh, the Warner-Lieberman uh, bill last year, failing to get 60 votes, uh, with another 12 that said that they would have voted against it had it made it, made it to cloture, when we look at the vote earlier this month in April, where the Senate voted almost by a two-to-one margin, including my two senators, uh, Evan Bayh, uh, a number of others uh, in the Midwest region, the Rust Belt, who again said it should not be part of reconciliation as part of the budget, thus requiring 60 votes instead of 50, they said no. I mean, as we try to work together on a bill, to me it's quite apparent that even if the House passes, a cap-and-trade tax, as Mr. Dingell called it, it is not going to fly in the Senate. So why don't we work together on a, on a number of things that, in fact, can bring us together? Uh, things like uh, a renewable portfolio standard to include non-carbon emissions as part of that. Thirty states have moved forward, uh, Mi uh, Michigan uh, among them, Texas among them, presume Massachusetts uh, among them. Uh, but as we look at the list of, of states with a uh, high percentage of carbon-based fuels, we look at Massachusetts at uh, 90, better than 90 percent, Michigan 86 percent, Texas at 95 percent, even Wyoming at 97 percent. I, I think it's clear that we, we can take a number of steps to, to focus on renewables, and we ought to make sure that waste to energy is part of that. We ought to make sure that wind and solar incentives are there. I'm one that believes that nuclear, which of course has no greenhouse gas emissions, we ought to be looking at that as part of that portfolio. And I'm convinced that we'll have a bipartisan um, majority on a number of those issues where we can, in fact, move that legislation, uh, ultimately uh, getting to the President's desk. Uh, you've made some good points about nuclear, and it's not uh, part of this bill. Uh, I intend to work with Republicans and Democrats to add that title to the bill when, when we get to markup in the, in the next week or two. Uh, I want to make sure that we don't have uh, caps on emissions before we have technology that, that can actually actually make sure that we, we get to those. Uh, uh, what, is, what is your sense in terms of the argument that I raised uh, this morning uh, about the WTO? Would that be a good idea to have an off-ramp? Uh, well, I, th I think that people have to recognize the very grave danger that this bill is going to kill jobs in the United States and that the bill is not going to have any automatic effect on other countries except to export factories and export work. I do want to recognize uh, that the distinguished chairman and my very dear friend uh, has come in, and it's, it's a great honor to be with him. Uh, and we uh, we did many different uh, things together over the years. Uh, most of them, I have to say, for the good, I would like to think, uh, for the country. But I do think uh, his testimony this morning or his comments this morning when he was uh, talking with the vice president, with Senator Warner, th this, is a, this is a tax. And, and here's the core challenge uh, that I find fascinating. And it's something which Mr. Butterfield, I thought, alluded to in his questions earlier and that Ms. Sutton alluded to. The argument is that we have to raise the cost in order to get people to transition out of uh, fossil fuels because fossil fuels are inexpensive. Okay, that's a legitimate argument. However, when you raise the cost, you're raising the cost. And then people say, but there's not really a higher cost when we raise the cost because somehow magically we're going to get to a promised land where it will be a lower cost after the higher cost. But if you're a normal person in this economy, if you've looked at us lose millions of jobs, if you're worried about your marginal uh, last dollar of your income, the fact that eventually someday we'll reach nirvana 
uh, may not comfort you while you go broke. And I think that the challenge for everybody who wants to punish us into change is to understand the people you're trying to punish are the American people. I'm very much in favor, as I think you are, uh, Mr. Upton, uh, to incentivize us into dramatic change. I think you could write a bill that would be truly bipartisan that would have a dramatic number of breakthroughs in getting to a cleaner environment and to less carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, but it would do so in a positive way, and it would do so by incentivizing rather than punishing, uh, and it would do so in a clean way that did not require a massive expansion of government bureaucracy. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Chairman Emeritus of the Committee. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to begin by welcoming my old friend, Mr. Gingrich, back. Glad to see you here, Newt. Um, I share your concern on the points that you have raised as you've gone over these, these matters. The question of competitiveness in this matter is a very important one. The question of how it is we're to address this business of global warming at the same time while we're dealing with the other questions of preserving competitiveness is a matter of great concern. China and India, as you have indicated, have, have indicated that they're going to be developing countries for always, and that, that means we have some problems. There are others who are out from under the burdens of this under the Kyoto Agreement and who have a potential for a large advantage over the United States. These things, I find, are very, very troublesome to me. And so the first question is, how do we see to it that we don't be the only country in the world which carries this load? How do we, for example, address the questions of trade? How do we, for example, address the questions of dealing with the business of cap and trade so that it doesn't impose excessive burdens on our people while letting others get away. Uh, what do we do with regard to addressing these concerns within the framework of a um, global cap and trade uh, package, but also within the framework of things like GATT and the WTO? Well, let me say, first of all, Mr. Chairman, um, you know full well in Michigan, in the area that you've represented so ably, uh, what the pain has been of unemployment and of competition killing jobs. I worry a great deal. The European experience was captured in one study in which a cement plant left Belgium under cap and trade and opened up in Morocco, actually uh, emitting more carbon in Morocco than it was originally emitting in Belgium, taking the jobs away from Belgians and giving them to Moroccans. And I, I do worry that if we unilaterally adopt this, uh, that it would be a disaster. Now, those, uh, Vice President Gore, for example, was very optimistic about the Chinese. You know, it might be useful to offer an amendment that said that the cap and trade section of this bill would only go into effect when the, it was certified that the Chinese had adopted a comparable program. Uh, I think that would be one way to guarantee that uh, we, A, I think would probably never go into effect, but B, that we wouldn't be kidding ourselves about what we're going to do to American jobs. Uh, I, I, in well, this Chinese, economy... Chinese, uh, when I was at Kyoto, told me that they were only, go, that they were a developing country, they were not going to be covered by the agreement, and that they would never be covered by the agreement because they're always going to be a developing country. <laughs> and... It's, I'm a witness to that. That that really happened. Yeah. Now the the problem that that is our concern here is we we have to do something about the wasteful use of energy in this country, and I, I'm I want I desperately want to support this bill, principally for that reason. Uh, but the question is if 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 we have this nasty balancing, on the one hand we've got to deal with the question of how we make other countries comply and cooperate, how we at the same time achieve the efficiencies that we've got to do, uh, how we force other countries to comply, and how we don't wind up with a, with a huge mess and a loss of jobs on our own hands. 
Look, I, I think you, you're putting your finger on the heart of, of the challenge of this bill. Let, let me just say, I believe you could write a bill that liberated the nuclear power energy industry and allowed us to move towards dramatically more nuclear, which would take a great deal of carbon out of the atmosphere. I believe you could write a bill which dramatically incentivized moving towards a green coal system of carbon sequestration uh, and using the carbon then to have enhanced oil recovery. I think you could write a bill which had a very substantial increase in research and development for materials technology, for hydrogen and for other breakthroughs. And I think, frankly, you could move ethanol from 10 to 15 percent of all liquid fuels, and you could move towards a much better use of natural gas. And the combined effect would both dramatically increase the American economy, reduce the amount of carbon loading in the atmosphere, uh, create a lot of American jobs, and improve our national security. None of the things I just mentioned requires a national federal bureaucracy to micromanage jacuzzis, and none of the things I just mentioned requires punishing anybody. And I think that's got to be part of the key. We have to, in a world market, when we unilaterally punish Americans, we cripple the American worker in competing with our foreign competitors. All right. Now, I got one other question. You and I have been floundering around in this morass for a long time. And both of us have seen our concerns and interests and feelings change. Uh, in April 2007, you had some comments on this. And in April 2008, you had some other comments. In 2007, you said, my message is that evidence is sufficient that we should move towards the most effective possible steps to reduce the carbon loading of the atmosphere and do it urgently. In April 2008, we sa you said, I want to be clear. I don't think that we have conclusive proof of global warming, and I don't think we have conclusive proof that humans are at the center of it. How do we, how do we rhyme those two statements? Well, Mr. Chairman, first of all, I believe, and, and I went on to say, as a conservative, I think conservation and caution are part of being a conservative. And I think that as a prudent person, you can take steps to limit carbon loading of the atmosphere without having conclusively proved anything about the, the causality of, of uh, whether carbon loading has any effect on, on, uh, on the uh, temperature of the Earth, because I think, frankly, it's clear, that, as, as uh, Mr. Barton earlier indicated, that there has been an increase in carbon loading of the atmosphere, and there will probably be a continuing increase. Uh, in the interim, I also wrote a book called Contract with the Earth. Uh, and I believe that it, I think it, one of the reasons I volunteered to come here today is I believe if we can find an incentivized, positive way to move to a new generation of, of, of greener energy, and if we can find a way to do it, that increases the competitiveness of the American economy, it is absolutely in our national security interest and our quality of life interest to do it. Uh, and so I do think that there are practical steps we could take, and I would associate myself with Mr. Upton's description of the kind of bipartisan bill that I think could have very widespread support that would help Michigan create jobs, it wouldn't kill more jobs, uh, and it would actually expand the choices of the American people. Uh, it wouldn't try to punish them into change. Thank you. It's good to see you back. For good to see you, sir. The right, gentleman's time has expired. The chair will recognize himself. Um, you asked, uh, Mr. Speaker, what uh, would the nuclear industry ask? Well, I can tell you that they asked this committee in 1992 to combine the construction and operating license. Uh, we did that. That was the 1992 Energy Act. In 2005, President Bush, Republican House and Senate, they asked the nuclear industry, what do you need? Um, they said, well, we need to consolidate the uh, licensing proceedings for modular nuclear reactors. Uh, that's exactly what was in the 2005 Energy Act. Uh, but in addition to that, we have authorized the Price-Anderson Act for them for uh, 25 years to protect them against insurance exposure because they are the only industry that cannot, in fact, get insurance from the private uh, sector, that we en enacted a production tax credit for the nuclear industry. Uh, we enacted a tax credit that allows all nuclear power plant owners to deduct the cost of the money they put into their nuclear power plant uh, decommissioning funds from their taxes. We authorized the DOE to assist companies in helping to get their power plant licensing requests through the uh, NRC. Uh, we authorized a wide-ranging DOE R&D program in nuclear power plant technologies. And perhaps most importantly, 
And this is what they say is absolutely the bottom line need that they have. We authorized a $50 billion government backed loan guarantees for the nuclear uh, industry and other advanced technologies, which means that if the utility defaults, the American taxpayer is on the line for the money, which is the system in France and China. They are socialist and communist countries. We adopted that provision for them. However, there is no question that even with all that said and done, that if there is a cap and trade system put in place and a low carbon economy is created, that that would be the best marketplace incentive for the utility industry to move back towards the nuclear industry, because then a premium would be placed upon this. So the marketplace is the best place for them, although they have been dependent upon government support for the last 50 years and they have only intensified uh, in their request over the last three or four years, which has been met by the Congress. So that is just the reality of the nuclear industry. It will do better in a cap and trade system. Second, on your point about the 34 times that the Department of Energy missed their deadlines uh, for appliance efficiency. That is accurate. They did. Uh, I know that because I requested the GAO report on that issue. I know and have a concern about it because they missed the deadline required in my appliance efficiency law. Now, without question, that led to uh, an additional dozens of power plants that had to be built fossil fuel plants in order to generate the electricity uh, for those um, appliances. However, the reality is, in addition, that when you were Speaker, there was actually a rider that barred adoption of any new or revised appliance efficiency standards, and a second rider actually barred any new standards for fluorescent light bulbs. So to bring this up to the jacuzzi amendment or the hot tub amendment, that provision is inside of the appliance efficiency uh, standards that we are going to require. Now, of all of the things that we would want to have high energy efficiency, it would be, I would think, jacuzzis. I mean, there, there is a discretionary purchase in the American economy. And all we are saying there is like light bulbs or refrigerators or stoves, that there should be high standards for energy efficiency in the manufacture of jacuzzis and hot tubs. It is just part of, what, it's part of what you were criticizing in the very beginning in terms of the Department of Energy not meeting high energy efficiency standards. And by the way, the standard that we included is the industry consensus standard. Uh, and the, the, a standard they say they believe all industry participants can meet. And I will just add this one other thing, which is that beginning in 1995, there was a rider attached to every transportation bill which banned the Department of Transportation from improving the fuel economy standards of the vehicles which we drive. So in the same way that not having high standards for appliances uh, led to more fossil fuel electrical generating plants having to be built, uh, sending more CO2 up into the atmosphere. So, too, did delaying the improvement in the fuel economy standards lead to more imported oil, yes, uh, but ultimately delayed the point in time in which the auto industry would have to meet the innovation test that the rest of the world was applying uh, to our auto industry. So I just point all those things out just to let you know that in the confines of this bill, the nuclear industry is a huge beneficiary. Uh, the, uh, the appliance uh, and uh, other uh, industries uh, will be dealt with in a way that I think matches the kind of prize that they should be receiving for uh, innovation. Uh, but it is just creating this work smarter, not harder economy uh, that depends upon innovation rather than the importation or the burning of domestic uh, fossil fuels unnecessarily, although where it is necessary, we obviously need it to continue. So that is the only point I would make to you, Mr. Speaker. This is, these are the things that I have been working on my entire career. And in a lot of ways, this bill that we are now debating makes it possible for us to move to the innovation economy. It makes it possible for us to move uh, forwards to 
uh, now deal with the reality that we only have 3 percent of the world's um, oil reserves while consuming 25 percent of it, which is an unsustainable long-term uh, uh, profile for our country. Just, just two quick comments. You, you have shown uh, great fortitude today and great patience. Uh, two comments. One, on the question of reserves, I would just cite back what I had said earlier. When you realize the U.S. Geological Survey just increased the Bakken Reserve by 2,500 uh, percent to between 3 and 4 billion barrels from what had been a very small reserve, and you realize that the Brazilians went in the last few years from 10 billion to 100 billion because they have barrels of reserve because they actually permitted looking for oil. I think, and, and we literally have gotten uh, a hundred years supply of natural gas discovered in the last uh, three years. I think that the reserve issue is not is actually not valid, but is a function of bad government policy. And, and I just would say, um, I can't imagine a, a much better way to close the difference between being liberal and conservative in America than whether or not one could allow consumers to actually evaluate jacuzzis or whether we needed a federal department of jacuzzi re regulation. I think it's a perfect contrast in our two approaches, and I have, I have great respect for you and what you're trying to do, but I do think it is a pretty dramatic difference in our view of how America should operate. Well, I thank you, Mr. Speaker, but again, I'm only referring back to your own criticism of the Department of Energy. And by the way, that was the Bush Department of Energy that missed all 34 deadlines for energy Well, I would say that the, the mismanagement, for example, of nuclear waste uh, cleanup processes has been an ongoing new Department of Energy problem across several administrations. And I, I have limited faith in the ability of federal bureaucracies to operate with agility and alacrity. And I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Speaker. But the, the reality is, is that the future gen project that you talked about and are critical of the Department of Energy decision to walk away from was a decision made by the Bush I, Department of Energy in 2000. I agree with you, we, and I'm, I'm we, happy to be bipartisan in my criticism. Just so you know, we put $3 billion into the stimulus bill for carbon capture and sequestration. We have already $10 billion built into this bill for carbon capture and sequestration uh, uh, research, uh, development, and demonstration. Uh, projects. Um, the fundamental flaw, to be honest with you, with, um, uh, with the, um, the nuclear waste site, because I was here, I was actually chairman of the sub this subcommittee back in that era, was that uh, rather than listening to the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the, um, this, this Congress uh, back then in that time um, decided that they would pick. Yucca Mountain in Nevada, ignoring the National Academy of Sciences. So it was not a science-based uh, decision. It was strictly political. And that's what we're now reaping the harvest of, because with, you put something near a river, near an earthquake fault, you're going to wind up long-term with real problems if you're trying to isolate nuclear materials for 20 or 30,000 years. So we're, we're hoping that we can create a bridge here. We're hoping that we'll be able to work together, Mr. Speaker, with uh, Republicans on this issue to find a way that we can move forward. Because in the long run, um, we only have 3 percent of the world's uh, global oil reserves. Even if it became 4 percent, we now consume 25 percent. Uh, and it's in the long run incumbent upon us to find a technological solution to it. And the quicker that we get to it, the quicker that we put in place the incentives for market-based, uh, science-based uh, breakthroughs, uh, then I think the, the sooner that we will be able to tell the, the, those countries around the world that we import 13 million barrels of oil from on a daily basis that we don't need their oil any more than we need their sand. But there's no way we're producing an extra 13 million barrels of oil a day. We only produce 8 million barrels of oil a day today. Maybe. So we need a plan in place in order to be successful. Governor, and we want to really work on a bipartisan basis I'm going with, to with as the large Democrats as and Republicans to accomplish uh, that goal. Uh, it is an honor for us to uh, have you with us today. I would like to conclude by giving you an opportunity to, uh, to give us your closing thoughts, your comments in terms of what you want us to remember as we go forward with the consideration of this legislation. Well, I'll, I'll, first of all, I'm very honored that you let me come over and share these ideas with you. Uh, and I'm very grateful uh, for the patience and the length of time you've put in today. I would say that 
there is a way to develop uh, an incentivized and a positive approach that can accelerate dramatically our moving towards more effective uh, energy systems. Um, I think that to the degree we divert that into trying to build a national bureaucracy and trying to create a national managed system, uh, that it is likely to carry us down a road we don't do very well. And I, I agree with what uh, Chairman Dingell said earlier this morning, that uh, watching the two efforts by the Europeans has not been very encouraging in terms of the likelihood of designing the system. But uh, I do appreciate the way you've approached it, and I hope that uh, you and Mr. Upton are able to find some common ground on which to write a bipartisan bill. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. And again, it's our honor to have you here with us. Thank you. Uh, we have 21 more witnesses to go today. Um, and uh, the chairman needs approximately a three-minute break uh, before we begin the next panel. So we'll stand in recess for th three or four minutes.